This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Merci bien pour l'invitation. Malheureusement, je vais parler en anglais. Je vais lire mon papier en anglais, mais si vous voulez poser des questions en français, j'essaierai de, de répondre. Pour commencer, je distribue ces livres. So I'd like to take the opportunity you've given me with your very kind invitation to speak about the Oxford history of the laws of England to discuss some questions about the nature of legal history and what it can teach the general historian about society, government, and even politics in 19th century England. The Oxford history is a particular kind of history. The aim of the project under the general editorship of Sir John Baker is to have a general history of English law from King Alfred to the First World War. It's de to, designed, in effect, to replace Sir William Holdsworth's multi-volume history of English law, which was written single-handedly by Sir William Holdsworth in the first half of the 20th century. His 16 volumes were largely based on secondary sources or printed literature. According to legend, he would go back to his rooms in All Souls College in Oxford after dinner uh, with, a, uh, with a carafe of port and write volume after volume with the various secondary sources around him. By contrast, the new series is designed to be written by specialists of each era, drawing mainly on primary archival sources, but also summarising the main currents in the secondary literature. Uh, as Fabrice said, these volumes that I've distributed, volumes 11 to 13, the last volumes in the series, were given to a team of six writers rather than a single author, which the others uh, are meant to be, mainly because it was thought that there was too much material uh, to cover in, in, in a single volume. In fact, it was designed initially to be only two volumes, but we just wrote too much, so they gave us three. So what, what kind of history is it? Legal scholars have often distinguished between what is called an external approach and an internal approach to legal history. They've usually agreed that law is, to some extent, autonomous from society, insofar as it has its own language, structure, and forms of power. But at the same time, law is the product of society and acts on and with society. It can never be completely autonomous. It can never be merely the product of juridical thought. To understand the distinct approaches, internal and external, we may borrow a, a metaphor from Robert Gordon, who suggested that we can think of law as a kind of box in which is to be found all of the elements which we think of as making law autonomous, which we describe as legal things. So those legal things might include <clears throat> substantive doctrine, or the institutions and procedures of the law. Outside of this box lies society with its social, economic, and political features. Society can affect what is inside the box, but it can also be affected by the box. So according to Gordon, those who study law from the internal point of view tend to look at what's inside the box, uh, notably the doctrine of the higher courts. And those who take the external view are more interested in looking outside the box looking at how legal things affect the wider society. And in the view of some scholars, um, there's nothing inside the box. It's all about society and that if you study law, you're studying simply a false language um, that doesn't really take you very far. Over the last 40 years, what we might call external histories of law have proliferated among those who work in history faculties, particularly the history of crime, from Douglas Hay and Edward Thompson onwards, uh, has seen uh, a great deal of uh, study of the uses of criminal law to structure relations of power in the wider society. The focus of these historians has not been on the language of doctrine or the legal arguments in court, but on issues such as the nature of legislation, the bloody code, the use of mercy in criminal law or the discretionary nature of justice, whether in the hands of prosecutors or the jury. And it's a kind of history that can be done very well by those who don't have a particular training in legal doctrine. 
Many scholars in law faculties have taken a similar approach, particularly in America. We can see it very well exemplified in the, the Cambridge History of Law in America, edited by Michael Grossberg uh, and Christopher Tomlins in 2008, the uh, red volume that is circulating. This volume, one of three that goes from the, um, uh, the early settlement of the North American colonies to the end of the 20th century, uh, the 19th century volume is written, half of it's written by people in history faculties rather than law faculties. The book begins and ends with a discussion of the American state, but much of the text of the Cambridge History of Law in America is devoted to discussing the social history of American law. There's very little doctrine in there. Rather, it looks at how Americans of various kinds experienced law and at how effective law could be in achieving its controlling ambitions. For instance, in her chapter, Elizabeth Dale looks at the criminal justice system in America, showing how the state never succeeded in obtaining a monopoly of violence and that substantive law was often ignored both by people outside the court uh, and by juries inside the courtroom. Many chapters in that volume look at the experience of those excluded from power or who were the victims of elite control. There are excellent chapters in that book on the experience of Native Americans, of slaves, of women, of workers. There are also chapters on how legal language and legal ideology entered popular culture. But there's almost nothing on the kind of doctrinal issues which filled the minds of practicing lawyers certainly in contract, property, or delict. As the editors say in their preface, their volume dwells on areas of concern and interpretive debates that preoccupy the current generation of legal historians. They want to look past legal historians to historians at large. So what's the definition of law which makes up the content of the Cambridge History of Law in America? It must be seen to be a very broad one. In effect, law in this volume includes any form of officially backed power and its use to structure social relations. It is political history without the high <coughs> politics, if you like. If you turn from that volume to the Oxford history, you'll find a very different kind of work. It is much more internalist. Where the Cambridge history seeks to be interpretive, reflecting a current generation's view of the past, the Oxford history has both a more mundane and also a broader ambition. Its ambition is mundane in that it seeks to describe the law as it was understood by practitioners in the practice. That is, to set out an almost encyclopedic history of how the legal system and its rules and doctrines worked. As we say at the outset, these volumes do not seek to provide a social history of law or to examine closely the impact of law on society, Rather, they seek to offer primarily a history of the law itself, focusing on its institutions and doctrines, and considering how these changed in response to changes in the wider world. Its ambition is broad insofar as it seeks to set out a foundation which will be regarded as reliable and useful uh, for a long time to come. Even if every detail might be corrected as more work is done, the idea is that it'll be somehow the first port of call for researchers working uh, in legal areas. So at first glance, that looks like rather an old-fashioned set of ambitions. So I want to begin with some comments on why this kind of history might be worth doing. One simple reason is that the work may offer a toolbox for other historians to use. Historians who work on crime or on women or on business may want to know how the legal system worked in which the people they study found themselves. One can fall into traps if one misunderstands legal terms. I was once at a seminar on the history of women in the 18th century where the scholar was talking about something called an action for criminal conversation. This was a common law action which a husband would bring against a man who had committed adultery with his wife, usually prior to seeking a parliamentary divorce, the only way to get a divorce before 1857. So it was an action effectively for adultery. The action was described in the law of the language as an action of trespass for having committed criminal conversation with the wife of the claimant. 
The speaker at the seminar spent a lot of time talking about the word trespass and saying it means walking on somebody else's land, trespassing on their property, and that seemed to reflect the fact that a wife was seen as the property of her husband, so then anybody who laid his hands on his wife was doing the same as walking on his land, and it was very much the idea of it being a proprietary uh, interest. Well, there's a lot to be said about uh, the relationship between husband and wife in 18th century English law, but the speaker didn't realise that the word trespass is a generic word simply meaning taught or wrong. So that, in fact, an argument was built on a misconception of the meaning of a legal word. And this kind of suggests that we have to be careful with legal words, that we know what they mean when we apply them to the purposes that we want to use them for. So that's a simple reason why we might study the internal history of law. But there's a second argument in favour of the internal study. Law is a central instrument of governance in any society. It can do many things. It can confer powers on people, giving them authority to do certain acts, giving them power over persons and property. Law may define the powers that actors in the constitutional system have. For instance, English monarchs after 1688 continued to have the the power to exercise the prerogative of mercy, but they did not have the power to dispense with the law. This meant that the king could pardon a convicted criminal, but could not render anyone immune from the legal process which would lead to a conviction. You can pardon, but you can't pre-pardon, if you like. If the crown attempted to exercise powers taken away by the law, then the courts could just say, this power is void. The king cannot do this, what Sir Matthew Hale in the 17th century called their potens irritans. There were, of course, very few occasions in the 18th or 19th centuries to discuss the uh, dispensing power of the monarch, since there was general agreement on the the constitutional settlement of 1688. But the Crown's power to dispense with, with laws was sometimes discussed incidentally. In 1709, there's a nice little case where Um, the Queen wants to import French wines, uh, although there is a statute during uh, a time of war to forbid all imports from France, and there is a debate whether the Queen is trying to dispense with a statute to allow her court to continue to drink the best wines they can get. And the court said, well, of course, she can't dispense with uh, a statute, but the statute doesn't apply to her, so she can still have the wine. Another case more within our period, where a lawyer raised the issue of the Crown attempting to dispense with law was uh, Charles Bradlaugh and Henry Lewis Clark in 1883, which shows how these debates can change their meaning in different contexts. The case arose from the atheist Bradlaugh's refusal to take a religious oath when uh, he was elected to Parliament. He found himself on court, in court on several occasions, and in the end, an act had to be passed in 1888 to allow members of Parliament to make an affirmation rather than swear an oath when they took up their seat. But in the 1883 case, a private individual tried to bring an action um, on a statute which gave a penalty um, and uh, rewarded the prosecutor. So he was trying to enforce the law against Bradlaugh. But the highest court, the House of Lords, hearing the case, said that he couldn't use this statute. The statute uh, said uh, that there was a penalty to uh, uh, to be paid But if the statute doesn't say um, that a common informer can sue under it, only the Crown could sue. So the prosecutor's lawyer said, but that means that only the Crown can bring an action, which means it can dispense with the law simply by not prosecuting. That would give the Crown the power to dispense with the law. But the court said, um, we don't agree. Although counsel had a point, The judges said that even if that were true, there were good reasons to leave these kinds of prosecutions in the hand of the government, because the government might be accountable to parliament, rather than private individuals who might use it for oppressive purposes. So these constitutional issues change context uh, according to uh, their different contexts. What I'm not going to talk about uh, where these constitutional issues become very much more important is, of course, in the empire, where the crown uses prerogative powers very much more extensively, and one does need to know a great deal about its powers when one looks outside the shores of Britain. At a more everyday level, it is the law which confers powers the individuals have to make wills or draw up contracts. 
it thereby imposes restrictions on how contracts and wills can be made, determining uh, by law what is possible and what is not possible. Just as a study of constitutional law is vital to help us understand what a government can do, so a study of many of the rules of private law is necessary for us to understand what families, businesses or private associations could do. Now, unlike the rules relating to the limitations on the king's prerogative power, many of these rules did not come from parliament or legislation, uh, but came from two other kinds of legal sources, either judges making decisions in court or lawyers outside of court devising new instruments, which could be used in new ways. These instruments, moreover, often developed in defiance of parliamentary rules. So you have powers developing that the lawyers have devised that go against what Parliament said can be done. The most obvious example of a device devised by lawyers is the trust, which was used by all wealthy families in 18th and 19th century England to hold and transmit their property through family settlements. The trust separated the legal ownership of property from the beneficial ownership so that the family's property could be legally owned and controlled by trustees who had to use it in ways defined by a trustee in favour of the beneficiaries, the family. A statute of 1536 had sought to arrest the development of this kind of split ownership, but the interaction of needy litigants and clever lawyers developed this device which would be central to later property relations. And the existence of the trust form therefore created a legal vehicle for activities which seemed otherwise to be unlawful or unprovided for. For instance, the Bubble Act of 1720 made it a criminal offence to act as a joint stock corporation if you didn't have authorisation either from Parliament or the Crown. That was because in the 18th century, the Crown wanted to limit the number of joint stock enterprises, particularly after the stock market crash of 1720. But many businesses were able to obtain all the advantages of incorporation by creating deeds of settlement which placed the management and the firm in the hands of trustees. This count continued all the way into the 1840s when the first statute conferring general corporate status was passed. So the trust form allows companies to do what would normally be illegal. They have a vehicle of their own that is devised by the law. Another example of private ordering uh, is given by Maitland when he eulogised the trust as a vehicle that gave legal personality to other groups otherwise ignored by the law, such as dissenting chapels that managed to get a status through the trust. So um, one needs to know a great deal uh, of how these things operate to understand how people can transmit property uh, or work with, uh, with property. Much law was generated of vital importance to economy and society which never crossed the path of legislators. And we need to understand this law both to see how it worked but also to see how it changed and to see how that facilitated or reflected social change. Besides conferring powers on people, the law, of course, regulates as a form of more direct uh, intervention by government. Legislation is the prime instrument by which rulers impose their will, and historians are, of course, very familiar with this kind of law. Many regulations seem very clear. So you might say, all I need to know is that Parliament passed this particular act, and then I'll know what it means and how it worked. But we might find that even the most straightforward rule becomes less straightforward in its application. For instance, the Betting Shops Act of 1853 can be seen as part of a clampdown on working class behaviour perceived to be disrupted by mid-Victorian reformers. The act was designed to suppress gambling by declaring it to be a common nuisance to use any house, room, office or other place for the purpose of gambling. The wording of the statute was ambiguous enough to leave doubts over whether it left room for street betting or gambling uh, at race courses or in public parks. And case after case goes to the courts where the judges disagree on its meaning. It's not clear whether you can't bet in Hyde Park, for example, or at Kempton Park Racecourse. The language of the statute was ambiguous and that allowed contested meanings to be argued in court which opened up a social space. Working class gambling could continue. And that can reveal that legislation might be less potent 
than governments think it can be. Once social actors begin to dispute the meaning of pieces of legislation or to argue that they mean something different in the context uh, of a wider set of laws, then they fall out of the control of the legislature and you need to ask what do the lawyers make of it and uh, what do the courts make of it. A close doctrinal study of the law can be helpful in other ways. We are familiar with the great test cases, political cases which assume a broad importance beyond the particular dispute they form part of. Interest in them can be generated as part of a big political cause feeding into a large debate. One well-known example of this in the late 18th century is the case of James Somerset, the African slave who was freed by Lord Mansfield's Court of King's Bench in 1772. Somerset, uh, the slave, had been brought to England by his owner, James Stuart, but in 1771 he escaped from his master, only to be recaptured and put on board a ship to be taken to Jamaica and sold. It was at this point that the leader of the anti-slavery movement, Granville Sharp, intervened, seeking a writ of habeas corpus to free the slave, the writ that is used to allow people to be released from their jailers who are holding them without authority. Sharp went to court to demand that the master of the ship bring James Somerset to court and show by what authority he was being held. His aim was to show that the common law did not allow slavery and thereby not just to free Somerset, but all slaves in the empire. This is a big political test case. The case was vehemently opposed by the West Indian merchants and neither side was willing to compromise. They push it to a decision. Both sides want a decision. Lord Mansfield, the judge, was very well aware of the great financial consequences of a decision adverse to the traders, but he was also very well aware of the question of liberty. And in the end, he decides that Somerset had to be freed using words which look like a great condemnation of slavery. The state of slavery, he said, is of such a nature that it is incapable of being introduced on any reasons, moral or political, but only positive law, which preserves its force long after the reasons, occasion and time itself from whence it was created is erased from memory. It's, that slavery, is so odious that nothing can be suffered to support it but positive law. So this can be taken as kind of condemnation. Slavery is against nature. It can't exist um, unless it's particularly created. But a closer reading shows how narrow this judgment was. He didn't say that the common law or the natural law on which many 18th century jurists thought it was founded made it impossible to have a law which made a man a slave. On the contrary, if Parliament chose to make a man a slave, it could do so. It just happened never to have done so in England. However, positive law in the colonies had provided for slavery, and Mansfield's judgment seemed to say that such legislation was perfectly okay. You could be a slave in Jamaica, you just couldn't be a slave in England. But that raised questions about the relationship between colonial and metropolitan law. Colonial legislatures were generally allowed to pass laws for their territories, provided they were not repugnant to the common law. Now, Mansfield said nothing about this issue. He just left that to one side, perhaps because the questions of repugnancy were left to the Privy Council rather than the King's Bench. American cases went to that political body rather than the common law courts. So he might have just have been limiting himself to the facts of the case. But there were other issues that might have troubled him. For instance, if a woman got married in Jamaica and thereby gained the status of a married woman, she would have been regarded as a married woman when she came to England. England would recognise the changed status of the woman under the forms of law which applied in Jamaica. But Somerset's case showed that the status of slave acquired under the laws of Jamaica didn't apply when you got to England. And perhaps this was because slavery was an unnatural condition, whereas marriage was a natural condition simply regulated by positive law. But if that was so, then that surely begged the question how an unnatural law was not repugnant to the common law, which might therefore control it throughout the empire. Mansfield did not want to answer this question because of the commercial interests involved outside of England. And the point is that political actors sometimes seek to invoke the language of law to, in, uh, to establish rights or settle political questions, but the judges in turn sometimes leave the law deliberately ambiguous and open uh, 
for their own reasons, political reasons. Uh, Somerset was taken by its champions as a great case showing that the air of England was so pure that none could be a slave here. But as James Oldham and others have shown, judges continue to be ambiguous on the issue of slavery into the 19th century. And as late as 1827, a mere six years before the abolition of slavery in the empire and two decades after the end of the slave trade, Lord Stoll in the Court of Admiralty held that a slave who had returned from Antigua to England with her mistress resumed her status as a slave on her return. English air did not free you. You were free in England, but you could be a slave when you went home. So to understand how these debates can be made and how they can contribute to the wider debates, one needs to study the, the language of law. So I hope I've convinced you so far of the importance of the internal study of law. Legal doctrine is an important tool in the social, political and economic life of a nation. What I want to do in the rest of uh, the talk is to look at a, a couple of areas which I think uh, can tell us um, interesting things about Britain in the 19th century, taken from the, uh, the, the Oxford History volumes. And the first area I want to look at is the nature of the state, and the second area will be uh, on private law. The uh, state, as you'll see uh, in the volume going round, was discussed, uh, public law was discussed by Stuart Anderson, so I'm uh, relating his uh, arguments. Stuart Anderson commences with an apparent paradox. We're familiar with the work of historians like John Brewer, who have stressed the creation in Britain in the 18th century of a strong fiscal military state, able to, create, uh, to fund the creation of a large empire by a small island territory. But against this, historians who look at the 19th century central state, apart from the tax-raising areas, customs and excise, see a rather small body. The state at the same time looks very big, but also looks very small. And it raises the question of what the state was in law. It's a question which has long troubled public lawyers because in England, there is no generic legal concept of the state. Nor was there any attempt to give the state a legal identity in the 19th century. In classic constitutional thought, executive government was the crown, the person of the sovereign. The common law did not touch this monarch, although constitutional writers claimed that the ordinary common law reached servants of the crown. As Blackstone put it in the late 18th century, the king himself could do no wrong. So the king is immune from all law. He is the source of law but cannot be touched by it. But the king has to act through ministers who would be held accountable for their wrongs in a court of law or through impeachment in parliament. The king's servants will always be accountable. <clears throat> this was all very well for an 18th century model of central government. But by the 19th century, ministers had bureaucra uh, bureaucracies with civil servants performing the functions of government. How were their powers defined? How was the state defined? As Anderson shows, there are two ways to develop central government in the 19th century. One is simply by the exercise of royal prerogative powers, and the other way is going to Parliament and asking Parliament to create an office. The Crown's principal secretaries of state, the main advisers of the Crown, the Home Secretary, the Foreign Secretary, were simply appointed under the prerogative powers. But the monarch also had the power to create new agencies in law um, and not to ask Parliament anything about it. Some offices were therefore created without statute. The Committee of the Privy Council on Education, set up in 1839, might have spent money voted annually by Parliament, but it was appointed by the Crown by virtue of its inherent powers. And it continued to operate for 60 years in a very bureaucratic way. Most cabinet members continued to be appointed simply as crown servants under the prerogative. In 1855, only three of 16 of Palmerston's cabinet were statutory appointments. The rest are appointed under prerogative. So much government carries on under the idea that it's being done simply by the king's personal servants. This is a very old-fashioned view. <clears throat> but constitutional law was also controlled by parliamentary practice. Since place acts passed in the 18th century excluded Crown officers from sitting in the House of Commons, legislation was needed for any office which might be seen to be political and therefore need a presence in the Commons. So the Crown did often have to go to Parliament 
For instance, when the secretaryship of war in the colonies was divided in two in 1855 to make two departments, a statute was passed to allow the holder to sit in the commons, although the statute made it clear that the office didn't derive from parliamentary authority, but simply from the crown. <clears throat> but a statute was needed to get into parliament. At the same time, there were many other agencies set up as government expanded, which were not meant to be part of this apparatus of crown servants at all, but which were meant to be separate bureaucracies. These bodies were meant to be different as Anderson explains, many statutes confer power not on the crown, but on particular ministries or departments. And indeed, in the 1830s, there was no consensus that the idea of the executive state and the idea of the ministers of the crown should be the same thing. Many new agencies were set up under statutory power, which acted as boards designed to be independent of ministerial control. And he gives us examples of the poor law commissioners the factory inspectors, the tithe commissioners, and there were a host of others which have their own accountability, not through a minister to parliament. And Anderson suggests that this constitutional life, these, this set of bodies, might have developed into uh, a system of public law where these boards would come under the scrutiny of courts which would check their powers. But they did not. As he shows, over time they lost their political independence and became subsumed in the ministerial system. By the 1880s, writers on government, such as uh, Albert Van Dyce or Walter Badgett, largely ignored the idea that there could be such independent bodies because they had come under the control of ministers. Instead of a chain of accountability to the courts in a defined system of public law, as was the promise in the 1830s, they came to be held accountable only in the public forum by having ministers to answer them, uh, answer for them in Parliament. Uh, and these ministers are still regarded as the Crown's personal servants. So this idea of personal servants takes over what might otherwise have been a 19th century public law state. And this links up with a second crucial feature of uh, Anderson's chapter on the stillbirth of public law uh, in England, which is the division between central and local government. Until the 1850s, he argues, it was unclear uh, what the constitution of the executive would be, which would be under ministerial control, which would be under uh, legal control under these autonomous bodies. But after 1850, he shows there's a sharper division which uh, has the central government being under the control of the crown and uh, local government being made up of a series of corporate entities subject to law and controlled by it. So the state is not a corporation. The central government is not a corporate entity. It's the person of the crown. But local government is a series of corporate entities that are accountable to law and not accountable politically. Stuart Anson traces a nascent public law uh, in the early 19th century which doesn't get going. He argues that in the 1820s and 30s and even into the 40s, both at local and central level, an idea of public trust evolved, which promised to give a special status to government organisations which were to be treated as distinct bodies from the uh, people running them and accountable to law. He traces this in four areas. Firstly, there's a growing idea of public trust from the late 18th century which underlay the, mo the movement for the abolition of sinecures in Burke's economical reform onwards and in the prosecution of corrupt officials. By the 1830s, this idea of public trust extended to reconceiving municipal government as being somehow a public trust rather than a private body. The second area he mentions is linked to this, which is, and it's a technical one, but one that he shows is quite important, which is that local authorities become exempt from paying local rates, local taxes, on the idea that they are non-for-profit uh, public organisations. So we have this idea that there is something public uh, about these bodies that involves a notion of trust to a wider kind of community. The other side of that picture, the third strand that he mentions, is that officers should be personally immune from legal liability when acting in a public office. Uh, as we've seen, um, it was well established that Crown officers are liable for their own wrongs. Uh, everyone is accountable to the law. 
But it becomes established that they're not accountable for the wrongs of anybody else in their department. So if you're the head of a ministry and the lowest clerk does something wrong, he's liable, but he can't be sued because he has no money. But you as a public officer are immune. Um, in the early 19th century, this idea, which begins in the 18th century at central government level, um, is uh, extended to local organisations, particularly improvement commissioners. In Hall and Smith, a case in 1824, the Chief Justice said that no one would undertake the work of an improvement commissioner, improving local roads, roads, local sewers and so on, if their personal fortune was held liable for wrongs done by those employed to do the work. Linked to this is the idea that individuals employed in public capacities can't be personally sued for contracts that they enter into on behalf of the government. And Lord Palmerston in 1827, when Minister for War, is held not liable uh, for the payment of a pension due to one of the clerks of the War Office because it's not his money, it's not his contract, it's a public thing. So you can see that there is this idea, and we'll talk in a moment about how you would get money if you're not suing the particular officer, where do, you, where do you get compensation for? But you have this idea that there is a distinction between the private capacity of a person and their public character, and you can't hold them personally to account for things done in their public capacity. Um, unless they've been personally negligent, as officers, they will be immune. But what happens next, uh, Anderson argues, after mid-century, is that local and central government took different paths, suggest, uh, subjecting the one to the rule of law, but not the other. The first significant case he discusses, which changed the law, concerned the exemption of liability for rates, a case called Mersey Docks and Harbour Board against Cameron in 1865, which looked at whether Mersey Docks was immune from paying rates since they were a municipal body created for the public good. Two considerations weighed on the minds of the judges. First, there was a lot of money at stake in an age where more land was occupied by public bodies. If public bodies didn't pay the rates, then other private bodies would have a very much larger bill to pay. But secondly, pu public docks operated very similarly to private docks. They might have been in public ownership, but they looked the same. So the highest court uh, here, the House of Lords, decided that the docks were liable to pay the rates. They were not immune from paying rates. But the court said the Crown is immune from rates. So central government agencies don't have to pay rates, but this is not a central government agency. This is a local organisation. So they make this distinction, whereas previously they'd all been exempt from rates for being public bodies, they're now saying only central government is. Only central government is, and it's because it is the Crown. The Crown is in occupation of prisons, it is in occupation of the territory of the army, uh, it's um, in occupation of all the buildings of the central um, executive, the foreign office, or of Whitehall, but it isn't in occupation of Mersey Docks. That's the Mersey Dock Company, so they're, they're different. The case was soon followed by a second one involving the same company, which, held, uh, which, which raised the question of whether the company could be sued for wrongs. So the liability of the Crown for torts or breach of contract was, uh, was tricky, as we've seen, because it raised the question, who do you sue if there has been a wrong? And you can't sue the, the minister or the, the person in charge of the office because they haven't done the wrong. In the mid-century, this question is raised when you have these local bodies doing wrongs. And judges began to hold that you could sue the commissioners, but they could reimburse themselves from the rates. So you're not suing them in their private capacity, you're suing them rather the way you would sue a representative of, of a company that they are being sued as representatives of the company who will reimburse themselves or pay the damage out, out of corporate uh, property. And that was confirmed in uh, a case in 1866 called Mersey Docks Trustees against, uh, against Gibbs, um, where the court said that this really is just like a company. It looks as if it's exactly the same as a private dock company, it's a public dock company, but the private company would be liable, so the public one will be liable um, as well. 
As to the arguments that it didn't have any money to pay, an argument that was often used against central government, they just say, well, future ratepayers can pay. They'll just have to raise the money on future um, local taxpayers. And they have no problem with that argument when it comes to local government. They have a big problem with it when it comes to central government. Because at the same time that this was happening, the central government's immunity from suit was confirmed. If local bodies could be conceptualised as corporations and subject to the ordinary law that, they, that applied to these bodies in regular courts, the central state continued to be seen as the personification of the monarch who could do no wrong uh, and who could not be sued. The central government is not a corporation, it is Her Majesty on the throne. And that could lead to paradoxical decisions where the courts went out of their way to deny people access to government money. When the Baron de Bode went to court in the 1830s and 40s to force the government to pay him compensation for the loss of his family's estates in Alsace, which had been confiscated by the French revolutionary government in 1792, and for which the French government had paid the British an indemnity in 1815 at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, the Baron was frustrated by what looked like contradictory doctrine. When he went to court to force the Treasury to pay money in its hands to him, he was told that it wasn't the Treasury's money. It was the Crown's money. The Treasury was only accountable to the Crown, not to the courts and certainly not to him. So he then went to the Queen, not suing her because you can't do this, but using a remedy called the Petition of Right, where you petition the monarch to do right. He's told by the courts that this remedy is not available because the Queen has never got her hands on the money. It's in the hands of the Treasury, not her money at all. So he falls between two stools and he never gets the money. Repeated decisions in the later 19th century confirmed the immunity of the Crown from civil suit. In law, the state was the most slippery of fishes. It could never be caught. Only if Parliament chose to give a central government body corporate status could it be sued, and they do this in some instances. But Stuart Anderson shows this, wasn't, this needn't have been so. In 1858, for example, the Government of India Act empowered the Secretary of State uh, for India in Council to enter into contracts and be liable for torts, paying money out of Indian government revenues. And in 1861, in a case called P&O against the Government of India, the Secretary of State was held liable for negligence at Bombay docks. So you did have state liability in India, you just didn't have it in England. And one reason was Parliament would have to vote money to pay for it in future. They certainly weren't going to do that, or they couldn't do that, whereas a local authority could. So there was no logic in the doctrine. It just worked that way. So uh, Anderson's discussion of case law and doctrinal theory when it comes to the state can, I think, cast fresh light on our understandings of the nature of the 19th century British state and its government. Um, commentators like Dicey often talk about... Uh, England being a land of liberty under the rule of law, unlike France with its administrative law system, which Dicey hates and says is tyrannical. And he says, in England, all officers are accountable to law. And yet, it was plainly wrong. Central government wasn't, and he just ignores that. A close examination of law shows us um, a different picture. In the time that remains, I want to turn away from this public law aspect to look at a private law aspect, uh, things covered uh, in my own work, uh, particularly contracts. Much of the regulation of private property uh, was left to the courts in the 19th century. It's an area where there's very little legislation. Um, Parliament was largely convinced by the arguments of political economists in favour of freedom of trade that the more was left to private ordering, the better. But in fact, the courts did have to mould and shape law to the new economic conditions and to the new um, social conditions. So it raises the question how the law shaped property relations, how law helped or hindered economic growth. Now, the role of law in economic development has been the subject of much debate for some time. And I think we can outline two schools of thought to begin with. The first to go back to the terms I used at the beginning, takes the externist point of view. It argues that contract law and all of private law is transformed in the 19th century under the influence of writings uh, of politi political economists such as Adam Smith and David Ricardo, um, 
whereby the law is reshaped uh, to meet the demands of a new political economy and to serve the needs of uh, industry. In the view of uh, the scholars who argue for this kind of transformation, 18th century law reflected the kind of moral economy identified by Edward Thompson in his classic work on the 18th century crowd. The 18th century was a world of just prices, paid for actual benefits conferred. Contract law was about conferring benefits and paying what the benefits were really worth. They argue that the model changed in the 19th century to a new one, where instead of being concerned with past benefits and paying a fair price, people were now interested in forward-looking security of expectations. Where the 18th century had been backward-looking, focusing on what had been done, 19th century <coughs> contract law is all about making future promises, binding yourself to do something in the future, and paying compensation for the disappointment of that uh, expectation. And the argument goes that this allowed the development uh, of a much more kind of integrated forward planning market. If you're importing goods from India, say cotton, you can enter into a contract for a particular price for a particular shipment and know now what you can plan for in six months' time. And if the person fails to deliver the goods in six months' time, you can sue them for damages for what you expected them to be worth at the point that the contract was breached. So it's all about having these future expectations. And these historians link this to the development of commodity markets in the 19th century, where they deal with future contracts, where you're, you're dealing with a world with much uh, more efficient mass communications um, and uh, faster trading steamships and so on, where you need to have, um, uh, where you can have future trading uh, markets. Along with this uh, came uh, a number of other changes. The idea uh, of freedom of contract means that the buyer had to be aware, so that you no longer had fair guarantees. It was all parties looking out for themselves. Uh, and there's also the idea that there is no such thing as objective value. The value of anything is what the parties put on it. So it's real freedom of contract stuff. It's no longer a moral economy. It's about um, a trading uh, economy. And um, historians have argued that um, the law develops in a way that mirrors and matches the needs of commercial litigants at particular times. It says in the 1820s there are no um, a time of unstable prices. There is no such thing as an objective price, so you can forget about fair prices. By the time price is stabilised, they say, well, there is this thing. It is, it is the price of a reasonable businessman. So it's not entirely subjective, it's objective, but it's the market that decides, not fair jurors. But the overall point is it's all designed to tie in with what commercial parties need. That external view has been challenged by legal historians looking from an internal point of view. They agree that there was a transformation in thinking about law in the 19th century, but they ascribe it to intellectual influences, not economic ones. In particular, they say that European legal writers in the natural law tradition, particularly uh, Robert Joseph uh, Potier, who writes a famous treatise on obligations, which is translated into English at the start of the 19th century, transforms the way people think about contracts. They think about it in terms of a will theory about the meeting of minds. They make the point that what the externalists see as new developments are not really new developments at all. The idea that the contract was the product of the party's wills, um, they say, well, you can find that back in Roman law. It's nothing new. You can, you can look back. Even in English writing, you get it at the beginning of the 18th century. The idea that a contract is about um, futures trading, you can find in 16th century cases. You don't have to wait for the 19th century. There aren't many of them, but you can find it in the past. And they say the whole idea that the 18th century common law was based on a moral economy is completely implausible. Um, Britain had already a great commercial empire in the 18th century uh, of traders doing transatlantic trade where you have ships that are insured, uh, that uh, deal with goods where you need local agents, where you need local uh, brokers in London, you have various commodity markets in London and so on. This is a system that needs rules where people can make their own contracts. It doesn't require everything to be 
refer to a jury to discuss what is fair the way you would do at a kind of local, small-level community. We're dealing with a large commercial society. This nice old world of a moral economy just doesn't work in that commercial world, and it's foolish to look for it there. So they, the internist view says that the 19th century sees a better theoretical articulation of contract law doctrines, but it's, it's nothing new. So there you see the contrast between ex internal and external views. So what's my view? Well, my view is that neither of these approaches quite captures what's happening in this era. We can neither think of law either as implementing the ideas of another discipline or another set of um, demands, or as simply running on its own track. Instead, legal doctrine was in constant dialogue, as it were, with the society it served. But we need to be careful about how we consider this dialogue. For the world of law is both a world of ideas and of practice. Problems from the world need to be resolved through the prism of a legal language which is recognised in court. Once you get to court, you have to speak a language that they can recognise. Much of the debate over the development of contract law in the 19th century talks about the impact of ideas. The externalists talk a lot about the impact of um, Adam Smith, uh, of Ricardo, of Mill and so on. If you look at case law, these are names almost never mentioned. Judges don't talk about economics. Uh, the internalists talk about the influence of Potier, of Pufendorf, of uh, uh, a series of Roman law writers and so on. Again, if you look at court material, that is talked about more, but those people influence treatise writers who digest what goes on in court, and then that feeds back into court later on, but it's not... Pri you know, case law is not primarily driven by what French writers uh, in Orléans are saying in the 1750s. The main motor of development was therefore the changing nature of the cases which litigants brought to court and the questions which judges were asked to resolve. The common law courts were asked to react to an endless stream of particular problems thrown up by social conflicts which needed resolving. These problems may not have uh, yet got Parliament's attention, perhaps they never would, Sometimes Parliament legislates, but in an unclear way. What it means is that the courts have to develop rules piece by piece to regulate particular kinds of practice. And they have to respond to different constituencies. And as I uh, argue in, in my uh, piece, there are at least four constituencies competing for the judge's attention in the 19th century. One are traditional families, aristocratic families making family settlements. Many cases go to court which are disputes about family settlements um, involving large estates uh, over multiple generations. A second set of litigants are the commercial classes that I've talked about. Business people who are dealing largely not with inheritance and landed property, but with the sale of goods. Um, the quality of cotton or the quality um, of foodstuffs. A third constituency, particularly from the mid-century, are ordinary consumers um, who are dealing with large businesses. The railway passenger who's got a ticket with a railway company. Uh, and a fourth, a very important constituency, also after mid-century, are investors. The growing middle class investors who buy shares in new companies and then find that they've bought shares in a company that is a fraud. So you have an enormous amount of litigation uh, after 1850 on contractual matters by middle-class investors in danger of losing their savings. So these are different constituencies with different needs who come at different times asking the courts to resolve their problems, often at a time when Parliament has done nothing. So there's no regulation by the government. So as you might imagine, the result was often inconsistent or shifting. It's too simplistic to say that the judges simply created a neutral model of contract in which the parties would be left to their own devices. Um, in many ways, what they have to do uh, is to regulate the market and moralise the market. So in many ways, what the judges are doing is creating a law that uh, uh, resolves the problems of fraud uh, or deception, which unsettle the economic machine, and which Parliament hasn't, uh, hasn't dealt with. Um, it's not simply something for the commercial classes, because it's very evident that 
Very often, historians sometimes say, well, the contract law just reflects what commercial litigants want. want. But in fact, very often, commercial litigants go to court with a particular test case to get a rule for their industry. They find they don't like the, 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 the rule and they avoid the courts. They have their own system of arbitration, their own systems of, of organising it. Whereas if you're an ordinary investor, you can't do that. You can't say, well, I'm just going to have my own system of arbitration with the, uh, with the company that's defrauded me. So we need to see uh, the courts as a system of regulation. You'll notice one class missing from my uh, list, the worker or the poor debtor. As Bill Cornish's chapters on uh, labour show, the law was consistently hostile to working men and women, both as individuals uh, and as collectivities in trade unions. The law was notoriously unequal. The Master and Servants Act of 1823 gave justices of the peace the power to imprison workmen who breached their contracts of employment. Um, the master is only liable in damages, although there's a summary remedy. Most cases involving the poor go before justices of the peace, not before the superior courts. The superior courts are manned by members of the political nation, dealing very largely with litigants who are of the same political nation, they only occasionally get appeals from the justices of the peace dealing with the poor, and then they come with uh, an often not very sympathetic approach to the poor. One example that I give is Unwin and Clark in 1866, where a cutler from Sheffield had been imprisoned for breaking his contract of employment. This is often done during strike time. You imprison the, uh, the strike leaders. He comes out of prison, he thinks, well, I'll just go off and do something else now. I'm certainly not going back to work for my old employer. The employer wants to jail him again for not coming back to work. The local JPs think, well, we don't think we can do this. An appeal is brought to the Queen's bench. In the Queen's bench, they say he can be jailed again. In part, they use straightforward commercial reasoning. This is a breach of contract. The party in breach cannot decide that the contract is terminated by breach only the innocent party can decide this. Standard rule in commercial law, just a straightforward contract case. At the same time, the judge says, yeah, but if we allow this to go ahead, this worker, you know, th this employer will be deprived of his workforce. We can't have that happen. So in fact, it's, it's a combination of using legalistic language, but also policy-making language uh, in a context where the ordinary rules of contract don't apply because you don't jail your commercial rival for breaking the contract, you do jail uh, the workman. So we can see um, that uh, the, uh, the law can work as a, as a policy tool in, in different ways, and judges develop the, the policy of law um, in a way that is uh, hostile to, um, to workmen. So all of this is to suggest that judges and courts played a central part in the governance of society and the economy in the 19th century. Judges were in many ways policy makers, but policymakers who reacted to different constituencies in different ways at different times. It's unwise to seek a single story about how law shaped or did not shape the economy in the 19th century in the same ways it would be foolish to say there's one answer as to how Parliament shapes the law or the, econ uh, the economy in the 19th century. We need to see how it developed and changed in response to uh, different needs. We also need to bear in mind that the law offered a different set of tools for government um, the common law had established rights uh, and established languages that need to be dealt with. It can't be switched around in the way legislation can. You can't do a sharp turn straight away. So the final example I give, which is a good example, I think, of how the law can be a tool of policy in the hands of policy makers, comes from an area which has been much studied by uh, recent historians of uh, the history of pollution, a lot of debate about how effective or ineffective the law was in controlling pollution in the 19th century. And it's clear that Parliament legislates relatively little, at least until the last quarter of the century, and relatively ineffectively. So there's been a lot of debate about how effective the common law might be in solving the problem of polluted rivers, particularly sewage pollution um, and chemical pollution in rivers. And a number of historians have recently looked uh, as one kind of case example uh, at a case in 1858 called the Attorney General uh, and uh, Birmingham, brought by a man called Sir Charles Adderley, who owned a country estate downriver from Birmingham against the corporation which was flushing its sewers into the river. 
and basically spoiling his land and making it you know, smell horrible and so on. He goes, after some negotiation, to the Court of Chancery to get an injunction to stop them doing it. Um, their lawyers say, if we stop doing this, we have a town of uh, 250,000 inhabitants, there will be a plague. The filth of Birmingham will overflow, you know, we'll get a cholera epidemic, uh, it'll, be, you know, it'll spread to the entire valley around Birmingham, and it will be a national calamity. The safety of the public is the highest law, says the council. The judge says, well, Sir Charles Utley has a right to his property, and you, are, you're, you have a nuisance. You can't do this. I don't, I don't care about your 250,000. It makes no difference to me whether it's 250,000 or one. You're not allowed to do this. And he gives, you, uh, gives, gives an injunction. So that, that looks kind of unrealistic and uh, maybe old-fashioned, putting the, the rights of the proprietor over the rights of the entire town. What's interesting and what uh, historians like Leslie Rosenthal and Ben Pontin have shown recently is this was actually part of a much longer-term battle. Adderley was not just a toff with a nice estate. Uh, he had uh, a very large estate with 27,000 tenants. Uh, he had his own very large population. He was also a member of parliament with a particular interest in sanitation. He was uh, chairman of the Sanitary Commission, whose report paved the way for the Public Health Act. His ambition was to get Birmingham to improve its sewage. And he was aware that the corporation wasn't spending very much because it wanted to save ratepayers' money. It was cheaper just to dump the sewage rather than to treat it. And the injunction was suspended. It wasn't, you can't do this. It was, we will hold this over you as a kind of threat, but you must keep coming back to the court and showing us what you have done. And the litigation doesn't end in 1858. It goes on until 1895. So for a number of decades, Adley keeps going back to court so that the courts turn out to be an instrument of bureaucracy, forcing a local government to do what central government isn't doing it. So the common law, in the hands of the right people, can be a very effective tool of social change and to force something through. So all of this is to say that the history of doctrine in a range of areas can, I think, give us new insights into the nature of law and society in the, uh, in the 19th century, but that also law is a, a, a crucial venue of governments and those interested in 19th century governance should study it as well.